Hello, and welcome to National Book Foundation's Book Up at Home monthly author visit series. My name is Andy Donnelly, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. I'm excited to welcome you to another installment of the, the 2021 Book Up at Home program. Our mission of the National Book Foundation is to connect people with books. Often that means connecting young people with authors and teaching artists in a book club setting. But this year, it also means offering these virtual spaces for young people to connect with authors and ask questions about writing and reading. Thank you to our Book Up partners for connecting students with these virtual events. And thank you to our funders at the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We have a very exciting guest joining us today, National Book Award finalist, Newbery medalist, and winner of countless other awards, Christopher Paul Curtis. Christopher Paul Curtis is the author of nine books for young people, including Bud Not Buddy, The Mighty Miss Malone, Elijah of Buxton, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, and Mr. Chickie's Funny Money. Mr. Curtis's books have been translated into languages around the world and sold millions of copies. They've been adapted as musicals and motion pictures and have now been classic texts for more than one generation of elementary and middle school students. He is originally from Flint, Michigan, which is a setting featured in a number of his books, including Bud Not Buddy. The students in the Book Up program have received copies of Bud Not Buddy and they've been reading and that they've been reading and discussing this month. They've come ready with questions from Mr. Curtis. If you have any questions during this event, type them in the Q&A and I'll make sure to ask them during the question and answer portion. With that, I'll turn things over to Mr. Curtis. Thank you, Andy. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking outside, it's snow coming down. Other than that, everything is fine. Um, what I'd like to start out with is telling a little bit about how I became an author and about my writing process, and then I'll uh, be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, I, as Andy said, I'm from Flint, Michigan, which is a city 60 miles north of where I am right now. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, where I live. And I moved here about 30 years ago. Uh, when I lived in Flint, Flint was a very different kind of a city because if you didn't have money to go to college or you didn't have the good grades you wanted to to get into the college that you wanted, or you just didn't want to go to college, you could always go work in a car factory and you would make what is the equivalent today of 40 or $50 an hour. So I can remember very clearly right after I graduated from high school, I said to my mother and father, that's it. I'm done with school, I wanna start working. And my parents got into a big fight about this. My mother said, no, I don't want you to work. You'll go in that factory, you'll start uh, buying things, you'll never come out. My father, dads are different. My father said, let him go, we can make a man out of him. Uh, I went in and of course, as they are 99.9% of the time, my mother was right. I got in there, I bought a brand new car, I bought a nice stereo system, I bought clothes, I started going out with girls, I just spent my money like crazy. And 13 years later, I finally decided I had enough and I quit. Um, and that's a really odd thing to do uh, in a, when you work in a city like Flint, where there's really one big industry because everybody's so tied into it that uh, if you leave it, it's like you fall off the earth. But I couldn't take it anymore. I can. Uh, I worked on the assembly line. And I just put doors on the Buicks, the big Buicks, and I knew I had to get out. When I woke up one night, and I knew I was awake, and I looked in the corner of my room, and the door hanging fixture was hanging in the corner of my room. And also, some of the time, I'd wake up and I could feel my bed moving at the speed of the line. So I quit, and I took a series of menial jobs. I worked as um, a garbage man. I worked as a maintenance man at uh, uh, an apartment complex. Um, I worked for a US Senator for a while. I just did anything I could to make money. Um, and then I got a job working just outside of Detroit. I had moved to Windsor and I got a job outside of Detroit at a place called ADP. It was a check, uh, check printing company, um, still around. And my job was to uh, empty the trucks that came in. I worked in the warehouse. And in the meantime, after I left work, uh, I took a year off the work from uh, ADP. And I wanted to give myself a chance to write. While I was in the factory, 
the one thing that kept me going for 13 years was reading and writing. I would go uh, and I'd start to read and I'd read a book and I'd pick it up. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes I'd pick up a book and I'd start reading it and I'd get about halfway through and I'd throw it across the uh, factory and I'd say, you know, I can write something better than that. So I gave myself the chance and went to, uh, I'd go to the library every day and wrote. And I said to myself, uh, a rare burst of common sense from me. I said, you know, this, you're gonna take this year off work. You gotta try to accomplish something. This is not a vacation. You have to be serious about it. Took the year off work, went to the library, wrote every day. I was my own boss and I had to give myself the same respect that I gave the bosses at the factory and the other jobs I did. Ended up writing uh, The Watsons Go to Birmingham in 1963. Uh, went back to work. Uh, the book came out and uh, you don't make a lot of money on your first book when it first comes out because nobody knows you, nobody's buying the book. Uh, but the book was the reason that I was able to quit uh, working at the warehouse. Uh, I was at work one day at the warehouse and a principal from a school that was nearby in Garden City, Michigan, called and said, we know you wrote a book and we'd like you to come and speak to our kids about writing. Uh, and I said, oh, sure, of course. And he said, we don't have much money. We can't pay you much, but uh, we can give you $300. I was working 40 hours and making $250 a week. So this was great for me. So I went to uh, speak to the kids, had a great time. The kids had a great time. I have a lot of fun uh, talking to young people and um, uh, work there. Uh, then I started getting calls from other schools to come and speak. So I was able to quit the, the, the uh, warehouse because I was doing speaking engagements. Uh, that went on for a while. And then I wrote my second book, Bud Not Buddy. This is Bud Not Buddy. It's too shiny. Um, but Bud Not Buddy is the story of a 10-year-old boy who's on the search for his father. And uh, it tells about, it takes place in Flint in 1936 during a period of time called the Great Depression. And this was a period of time when nobody had work. It was very, very uh, bad. Uh, children, 10, 11 year olds were on the road. Hundreds of thousands of American children were on the road because their parents couldn't feed them. Um, this was uh, something that I wanted to write about. And so that book came out, uh, did very well. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my writing process. Everybody does things differently. Uh, I don't outline, and it's not a good idea, especially when you're a beginner, <clears throat> excuse me, especially when you're a beginning writer, uh, because if you don't outline, your writing has a tendency to meander, to wander. You don't get to the point. But I found that if I sat down and wrote, uh, I just let the story take over that I could do it. Uh, and what I found out was that as I sat and wrote, uh, I, I get up very early so from working in the factory for all those years. I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning automatically, still do it. I hate it. Uh, but I do that every day, get up at five and I'd go to uh, uh, a donut shop and I would write. And then the next day I'd get up and I would edit what I'd written the day before. And through this process, I started to uh, get the shape of the book going. And uh, it turned out to be uh, the Watsons go to Birmingham. There are a lot of different, uh, people ask me a lot of times, who were my biggest influences as a writer? And they want to know what writers influenced me. I was not a big reader as a child. I was a very good reader. When I was in sixth grade, I was reading at a 12th grade level, but I didn't like to read novels. I didn't like to read books. I'd read Mad Magazine. I'd read Time Magazine. I read just about everything, newspapers. I was a good reader, but I didn't find any joy in reading. And that didn't occur until I got in the factory and started reading every day. And I realized uh, the power of words and uh, that books could, I, I can remember reading one time and sitting in the factory and I just broke down and cried. And you know, people were looking at me like, what's wrong, what's your problem? And uh, it, it was because I'd read something. I was, I was really into this book and I felt like I wanted to do that. So. Uh, I started out reading, uh, started out writing, and the biggest influence on my writing really were my parents. 
uh, my mother in particular. She gave me the best review I will ever have for one of my books. I was in fifth grade at the time. Uh, and the teacher had given us an assignment to write a, uh, like we were writing for a newspaper that was taking place during medieval times. And so I wrote uh, this story about medieval times and brought it home to work on it. And as I said, my mother gave me the best review I'll ever have in my life. She uh, asked me what I was doing and I explained it to her and she read it. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I wish you hadn't brought this home. They'll think an adult did this. And that just, it just lifted my heart and made me feel so good. Uh, and my mother kind of became um, my, uh, my muse and um, uh, she, she played a really important part in my writing. A lot of the, when you first write a book, uh, it's kind of a truism that the, what you write is autobiographical. And with the Watsons go to Birmingham, there were parts of it that were autobiographical. The whole story was not autobiographical, but there were parts of it that were, uh, that happened. And a lot of the scenes dealt directly with me and my mother. And I can remember when I was younger, uh, I was kind of like a little fire, but I liked to light matches. And this is in this uh, chapter five of the Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. And it's a chapter called Nazi Parachutes Attack America and gets shot down over the Flint River by Captain Byron Watson and his flamethrower of death. And this was uh, based on me. Uh, in, in the book, Byron Wood, uh, the, who was the semi-juvenile delinquent son, would light matches and he'd make toilet paper parachutes and let them float over the toilet, uh, light them on fire, and when they'd hit the water, he'd flush them away. He pretended he was making a movie. As I said, this was based on me. I wasn't that creative. I just used to light matches and throw them in the toilet. I love the sound they made when they hit the water. So I was in the uh, bathroom, lighting matches, throwing them in the toilet, flushing, light, flush. And the bathroom door came open and my mother came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, mama. And she put her finger on my nose and said, you light one more match in this house and I will burn you. And I thought, yeah, you're gonna burn me, yeah, right. So I gave her a little time to cool down. Uh, next time I did it, I smartened up. I locked the bathroom door before I uh, started lighting matches. I'm lighting and flushing and lighting and flushing. And all of a sudden, I hear this boom. And my mother kicked the bathroom door open. She came down. She grabbed me around a collar like this. She lifted me up in the air. She put her finger on my nose and other fingers again and said, I told you what I was going to do. And I said, yes, mama. I know. And uh, so she went to the kitchen. She came back. I knew she was serious because she brought back a book of matches, a Band-Aid, and a jar of Vaseline. And for those of you who don't know, in the old days, people used to put Vaseline on everything. You had a bruise, they put Vaseline on it. You get burned, they put a little bit of Vaseline on it. You fall and twist your finger, you get Vaseline on it. So I knew I was in big trouble. So she came into the uh bathroom and said, stick your finger out. And I stuck my finger out and I was shaking and crying and I could hear the match go, oh, whoosh. And I could smell that sulfury match smell. And she said, if you ever, and I shook, she said, ever, and I shook again. And then I'm not gonna tell you what happened. You have to read the book to find out. But uh, that's one of the things, uh, reasons that I said my mother was one of the biggest influences on me. And she was, um, uh, when my, when the Watsons Go to Birmingham was finally published, I had come over to her house. I was using her mailing address and uh, we had come back in from somewhere and we opened the mailbox and there was a letter from um, um, Random House, Wendy Lamb Books. And it said, uh, you know, that you had won the, uh, there was a contest that I'd entered in the Watsons didn't win the contest, but they decided to publish it anyway. And uh, so, and I can remember my mother's reaction was, uh, she kind of just, her knees buckled and she cried. And it, it made me feel uh, really good because, you know, I was a disappointment to everybody. <laughs> I was 42 years old. I was doing these little medium jobs. Um, you know, I was doing what I could. And uh, I, I knew I had potential to do more. 
Um, and I stuck with it and finally got it done. And if you pull anything out of what I say today, take that, learn that, keep working, pick something that you want to do and keep working at it. Keep plugging away at it. You And you can learn from doing that and you'll get better at it. And I, I'm not saying sports. Sports are a completely different thing. Uh, sports are fine and do a lot of good things for you. But the chances of you becoming a professional athlete are like one in a million. Really, it's about one in a million. These professional athletes are, are kind of like superheroes. They are... Uh, they can do things that normal people can't do. I played a lot of basketball and I played with a professional guy uh, for a while. And he was just, it was just like he was in another world. But if you work on something like dribbling, learning how to dribble a ball or pass a ball or whatever you want to do, and it doesn't work out, you don't really have anything to fall back on. If you learn how to write and if you read a lot uh, and learn how the whole process works, even if you don't become a professional writer, you have improved yourself. You have developed skills that will be very helpful for you uh, for the rest of your life. So um, after uh, the Watsons go to Birmingham and Bud Not Buddy, uh, I started uh, doing other books. Um, and once again, my uh, mother played a very large role in it. Uh, I can remember uh, there was a, a situation with my brother uh, David, who was four years younger than me. And I woke up one morning and, you know, I'm a typical older brother. You, you tease your, your uh, younger brother. That's that's your job. My job, I was very good at my job. And I would tease him and I would bug him. And I, I woke up one morning and I went over to the crib and I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And this is where I got the idea of sticking a pencil in somebody's nose. Terrible thing, don't do it. Uh, and um, as I, I looked down, and he was, uh, he had, uh, during the middle of the night, uh, he had bled and thrown up and his face was half covered. And I can, you know, just terrified. I ran to go get my mother. And I can remember sitting uh, on the coffee table in the uh, living room. My father had to borrow, we didn't have a car. He had to borrow our neighbor's car. He wanted to take David to the hospital. And I can remember um, my mother holding David and rocking her hands rocking back and forth and back and forth. He was unconscious. And she said, uh, uh, she didn't say anything, but I can remember that watching her hands was something magical for me, that she would rub David's forehead and she'd pat my sister's uh, back. She was crying, I was crying, she'd wipe my tears. And I can remember thinking, it's like her hands were speaking a whole nother language. And I've tried to use that in every book that I've written but I haven't found the right book for it so far. Um, I, uh, I know it's out there. One day, uh, the book about the, the language of hands will be there. My brother uh, did fine, he survived. Um, it was, we never really knew what it was, but uh, that was uh, something that uh, I, I drew inspiration from. As, as a writer, one of the things that you have to do as a writer, you have to have your eyes and your ears open all the time because there's always stuff coming in that you can use in your stories. A lot of times when I speak to young people, they say to me, uh, where do you get your ideas? Oh, it's so hard to think of anything. It's actually the opposite for me. Everything I do, I can uh, find a story in it and I can do it. Um, I, I have rules for writers. Uh, rule number one is writing is like anything else that you do. Uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So write every day. Keep a journal, keep a diary, just write about the things that are going on in your life and save them. Never get rid of them because you will uh, you go back later and look at what you were thinking about at that time in your life. And it's going to surprise you the way you think differently. Rule number two, as a writer, you are a very, very powerful person. You can uh, rearrange time. You can destroy people. You can destroy worlds. You can build worlds. You can make superheroes. You can do all kinds of things. Have fun with it. So have fun with your writing. Uh, rule number three of Christopher Paul Curtis's rules and things for having a funner life. Rule number three is to, and I always forget this one, be patient. Be patient with your writing. 
I'm an older writer now, and still I have to be very patient because the story does not always go the way I want it to go. I'll tell the story, it's going this way. The story tells me, nope, we're going this way. Be patient with it. It's, as I said, it's a skill, something that you learn how to do. And uh, don't give up and, and don't ever believe in anything called writer's block either. Because once you do that, you've surrendered. Just realize that there's something wrong with your story and set it aside for a while, then come back to it. And your brain is a marvelous organ. It is just marvelous. It works on things even before, even when you don't realize you're working on it. Rule number four of Mr. Paul Curtis's rules and things for becoming a better writer is, and this one's the most important, ignore all rules. And what I mean by that is, once you learn how to write, once you learn how to develop a story, it's gonna take you a while to do this, probably not until you're an adult. Uh, writing is an unusual art in that there are no prodigies. A prodigy is a child who can uh, do something as well as an adult or better even. Uh, you have musicians that are prodigies. You know, you have athletes that are prodigies. Uh, there are all kinds of prodigies. We don't have writing prodigies. And the reason we don't have writing prodigies is because I think you have to live to uh, be a good writer. You can write very well and you can uh, have stories to tell. One of my favorite writers is a man named Kurt Vonnegut. And he was a uh, professor at uh, Iowa State University at the writing school there. And he said that he sees so many young writers who are excellent writers, but they don't have anything to write about uh, because you haven't lived. Uh, be patient and it'll come to you. Uh, so those are my rules for writing. Um, I, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about uh, Bud, not Buddy, uh, which is uh, the book I think a lot of you have read. Um, uh, Bud takes place, as I said, during the Great Depression. And uh, another wonderful thing about being a writer is you can keep people alive that you've lost. You can bring them back to life. And what I did with Bud, not Buddy, I was able to bring uh, my grandparents back. Uh, my father's father was a big band leader and he had a band uh, with the greatest name of a band I've ever heard. And I used it in the book. Uh, his band was called Herman Curtis and the Dusky Devastators of the Depression. So that, uh, I put him in there. I based the character of Herman E. Calloway in But Not Buddy on my grandfather. Uh, my father's father. My mother's father uh, led an interesting life too. Uh, during the Great Depression, people had to have a million hustles to, to get by because there was no work. My grandfather worked at uh, the train station in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he was a, a red cap. And you've heard of Pullman Porters. They were the people who traveled on the train as it uh, went from place to place. Pullman Porters were the people who unloaded suitcases and um, uh, helped load the uh, things onto the train that, that were going. And my grandfather uh, was a, a hustler. He worked very hard. And um, I remember my mother telling me that my grandmother used to have to sew double pockets into his pants. He'd have to reinforce the pockets because he would get so many tips uh, in, uh, that he'd put in his pocket that they'd break the pockets out. Uh, he was very successful at this. He was the only African-American man in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I've heard this a million times from him, who was able to buy a new car. He had, uh, was so successful that he did that. But he was also a, uh, a player in the Negro baseball leagues. He was a pitcher. Lefty Lewis was his name. And um, as I think everybody who's ever picked up a baseball back in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. He pitched against Satchel Paige several times. Whether he did or not, I don't know if that's a legendary or whatever. But uh, very interesting life there. So I did that. Um, as a writer, I had the ability now, and it's been, uh, Bud has been out for 20 some years now and uh, read by millions of people. I've kept my grandfathers alive by that. I've, uh, I have, um, uh, their memories are still alive. Uh, and that's one of the things I say at the end of the book. Be smarter than I was. 
listen to your grandparents. Like I can remember going to my grandparents all lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I can remember going to Grand Rapids and going and being with my grandparents. My, my, I stayed this summer with them. And I can remember thinking, oh, gee, you know, the, the one thing I really don't want to do is sit and listen to grandpa's boring stories anymore. And uh, I'd want to go outside and throw rocks at birds or, you know, something that, something like that, just some nonsense. And I think of all the stories that he told me that I was just sitting there pretending I was listening. And uh, I lost a lot of things like that. Be smart. Go talk to your grandparents. Go talk to your parents. Find out how uh, life was for them. I know a lot of you think they're uh, boring and old and all these things, but uh, they have interesting lives. And believe me, as you get older, you're going to want to know more about their lives. Um, right now, I am uh, working on a book that I've been working on for a long time. It's, it's hard coming to me, and it's called The Sanctuary Sessions. And it takes place in Flint, Michigan again. This takes place in the early 60s. And in the early 60s in Flint, I lived in a neighborhood on Flint South Side that was an all black neighborhood. You know, we hear about segregation and we always uh, instinctively tie that with the South. Not true. Most of the segregation in the United States took place and still takes place in large American cities. I think the most segregated cities in, in the U.S. are Cleveland and Detroit, uh, great big cities. And uh, they're, seg they're very strictly segregated. This had advantages, though, because as I was growing up, uh, I was in an all-Black neighborhood. Teachers, my teachers were mostly Black. Uh, doctors were Black. Lawyers were Black. Professional people were Black. So I had a lot of examples of people who were successful and were Black. And it, it, it kind of um, uh, helped me have a, an image of myself that was very helpful as I grew up. Um, and, and this book, Sanctuary Sessions, takes place in 1965 or six, I think. And it's the uh, story of urban renewal. And urban renewal was when uh, the cities would bring an expressway. They want to make it so people could get in and out of the cities as quickly as they could. And uh, they put expressways, they tear whole neighborhoods out. And lo and behold, the neighborhoods were mostly black neighborhoods. And it was um, something that I didn't realize had much of an impression on me. At the time, I didn't think it bothered me at all. But then once I started writing about it, I realized how devastating it is to just have your whole neighborhood wiped out, so many aspects of your childhood wiped out, where you can't uh, go and you know have memories of your childhood. Uh, my, my memories of my childhood are a clover leaf on I-75 and I-69 in Flint, Michigan. Our house was dead in the middle of where the clover leaf is now. And this story tells about a boy and his father, or his grandfather and his mother, and their um, attempts to deal with moving into a new area and uh, the kind of pressures that they undergo. And it, in some ways, it reflects my life because we moved out of this all black area and then we moved into a mostly white area. It was a difficult transition for me. And um, that's another great thing about being a writer. You can work things out. You can uh, have the things that have bothered you. You can write about them. And then you start to understand them in ways that you didn't before. But uh, that's uh, pretty much about how I've become a writer. Uh, but uh, another book of, of mine, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, as I said, came out uh, the 25th anniversary. So this is 25 years ago. This book came out. And there's a part of it that I'd like to read to you, very short part, that uh, is very important at these times right now. Um, I have to admit, I was becoming very cynical and didn't think there were many good things happening with uh, American history and, and, and the way um, the country was going. Uh, but uh, two or three years ago, when Black Lives Matter really started, I started to have a, a different feeling about it because I saw something that I hadn't seen since the 1960s when uh, in 1963, 1964, there was something called Freedom Rides. And this was people from the North, black and white, young people 
uh, young college kids, high school kids in some instances, who would board buses and go down into the South to try to fight segregation. Because they knew once they got South, they were gonna run into something horrible. And they wanted to highlight this, highlight this and let people know what was going on. And I always had such admiration for those young people. There was a young uh, uh, man uh, from our neighborhood who went uh, on the Freedom Rides. And they were selfless people. And they, uh, some of them gave their lives. And these were black and white people. And I hadn't seen anything like that to, until Black Lives Matter came along. Um, and we see there, I, it, it does my heart so much good to see these demonstrations of people working together and, you know, you, you have just as many white people as you have black people fighting for rights. Where it'll go, I don't know. I think it's hopeful. I think this new generation and the generation that you guys are in, that um, you understand things differently than, than the way my generation did. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And one of the things I said in at the end of the Watson's Court of Birmingham is despite the dangers, the civil rights movement grew stronger, gaining support all over the country. On August 28th, 1963, 200,000 people marched on Washington, D.C. to pressure Congress to pass the Civil Rights Bird Bill and heard Martin Luther King Jr. deliver his unforgettable I Have a Dream speech. President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill on July 2nd, 1964 and signed the Voting Rights Act on August 6th, 1965. In 1968, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act. The individuals who supported the civil rights movement took great risks to force America to change. It was a people's movement, inspired by the courageous acts of ordinary citizens like Rosa Parks, the seamstress from Montgomery, Alabama, who began the first great effort of the movement, the Montgomery bus boycott of 55 and 56, when she refused to give her seat up to a white man. Many heroic people died in the struggle for civil rights. Many others were injured or arrested or lost their homes and businesses. It is almost impossible to imagine the courage of the first African-American children who walked into segregated schools or the, strengths of their, the strength of their parents who permitted them to face the hatred and violence that they knew awaited them. They did it in the name of the movement in the quest for freedom. These people are the true American heroes. They are the boys and girls, the women and men who have seen that things are wrong and have not been afraid to ask, why can't we change this? They are the people who believe that as long as one person is being treated unfairly, we all are. These are our heroes and they still walk among us today. One of them may be sitting next to you as you read this or standing in the next room making your dinner or waiting for you to come outside and play. One of them may be you. And that's the feeling that I have with uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and the way that so many people of different backgrounds uh, are working together to try to make change. Now, I think we have time for questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to ask, I'm sure Andy can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for the reading that you did and, and for the the um, history that you gave us and, and the biography there and and the rules as well uh, that students will know uh, from having read. I have the this copy here, the new copy of Bud Not Buddy. Uh, if your talk inspired a lot of questions that came in, uh, students, if you have other questions, go to the Q&A section at the bottom, type the question in there and it'll get sent to me and I'll, and I'll make sure to ask it. Uh, we have a lot of questions about your inspiration and about Bud Not Buddy, and a lot of questions about the history as well. Um, so I have a question from Elizabeth who wants to know for specifically about Bud Not Buddy, but I think for, for all of your books, why did you choose the time periods that you did? So we know Bud Not Buddy is set during the, the Great Depression. Uh, why choose the Great Depression um, as this way of telling that story? Elizabeth? I don't know. I don't know. The stories come to me. And uh, it's when you're writing something historic fiction, you need there's a big event. And I like to look at the event through the eyes of a young person. And uh, they look at it in a completely different way. And I don't want the story to be, uh, even though But Not Buddy takes place during the Great Depression, it's not a story about the Great Depression. It's a story about a little boy who is uh, searching for his father and for searching for a home. 
The Watsons Go to Birmingham takes place during the civil rights movement. It is not a book about the civil rights movement. It is a book about a family uh, and, and their, what life was like for them. Uh, a lot of the criticism that I get from young people about the Watsons Go to Birmingham is they don't go to Birmingham till like the last fifth of the book. And uh, that's because it's a story about family. And I think one of the reasons this book and But Not Buddy have been successful is because they aren't uh, books about movements or about something grand that's happening. They, they tell small stories about families. And we as readers can uh, know things that the characters don't know. And we know where the story's going and we know how different things are affecting them. So um, and that's why I, I enjoy uh, starting a story and I start a lot and they don't go anywhere. But then I start some and they catch fire. And uh, I, that, that's when I know I've got the stories, when the story catches fire and I just sit down and I start writing and it comes and comes. Thank you, Elizabeth. So we have a similar question then, or maybe a follow-up question from Zoe, who wants to know more about that theme of family and asks, why, why choose a book where the child doesn't have parents to begin with at the beginning of the story? Why, why make the story about a search for parents or a search for his father in particular? Um, yeah, well, you know, I say it's a search for his father, but as um, um, my mother had died and I'd gone to a play of Bud Not Buddy, and as I was watching it, I realized it was more a search for uh, his mother. He was looking for his mother. It was his mother that he really missed. And uh, on the, the journey was, uh, he knew his mother was gone, so we had to find the next best thing, which was his father. Um, I don't know, I, I, uh, I like to write from the point of view of a young child, a 10 year old, 12 year old. Um, I've written older books, uh, but uh, those, that, that seems to be the age that uh, I can uh, really grab hold of. Great, thank you. Question from Elisa asks, um, does the work that you do ever make you emotional? Do you ever get emotional in the writing that you do? And if so, how do you deal with that uh, in your work? How do you deal with that in your writing? Alisa, if, if it doesn't, I'm not doing something right. Um, when I go, like I said, I write in the donut shop now. I used to write in the public library, but I got to know too many people and I was talking more than I was writing. So I go to this donut shop and I sit in there and I write and I know that people think I'm I've got problems because I'm, I'll am i be writing and I'm really into the story and I'll be laughing my head off or I'll cry some of the time, you know, I, I'll cry. And to me, it's a very positive thing because I know that if it's making me cry, that uh, it's touching something inside of me. And I, I hope that it can translate to other people and that uh, they can understand what it is I'm trying to do. Um, so yeah, I, I consider that if, if I don't cry during a book, or if I don't laugh out loud, I know there's a problem with the book. Question from Fatima asks, how do you come up with the titles of your books? Good question, Fatima. Um, you, you always start with a working title, which means as you're working on the book, you don't know what the title is going to be. But like when I was writing the Watson's book to Birmingham, I, if I was describing it to somebody, I'd say, uh, you know, it's a book about a family that gets in the car and goes down south and uh, is touched by the bombing and it comes back. You need a shorthand. And so uh, with the Watsons go to Birmingham, uh, the mother is keeping a journal as they're going south. And uh, she calls it the Watsons go to Birmingham 1963. So that kind of stuck. And that was the uh, original title. That was the working title. And it carried over. Uh, I can remember my editor, Wendy Lamb, saying, eh, not a really good title because it's too long, it's too complicated, um, people are going to, you know, not know the title. And she was right, in because uh, a lot of times people come to me and say, oh, you wrote that book, uh, uh, The Wilsons Go to uh, Chattanooga, uh, uh, and whatever. And, uh, but, you know, uh, that's the way it stuck. But Not Buddy um, got its title because... Uh, it was a very important thing for Bud. His name was something that his mother had given him. 
and had told him that his name was Bud. Your name is not Buddy. Buddy is a name for somebody who's being false friendly or a name for a doll. And you are not a doll. And so when he'd meet people, he'd, and they'd say, what's your name? He'd say, my name is Bud, not Buddy. And I, as I was writing, that kind of became the shorthand for the story. And it stuck. So um, I'm not, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do, uh, to, to name your books. And it's an important thing to do, too, because uh, a, a title can really make it so people don't want to read the book and it's not a good title. <laughs> Both classic titles that that stuck from the the working title version. Has there been a, a book title that's changed drastically or changed in surprising ways for you? Uh, my last book, uh, the Journey of Little Charlie, was originally called um, the something of Chucky Bobo. His name is Chucky Bobo, uh, but. Uh, when you write a book, one of the good things is so many people at the publishing house read it that uh, you get a lot of input that way. Uh, my relationship with my publishing house and with my editor is a lot like what a student's relationship is with their English teacher. You, you listen to what they say. If you're smart, you, you really listen carefully because uh, they have more experience than you. They might know things. Um, with uh, uh, the journey of Little Charlie, uh, the when the book was translated into Spanish, Bobo his last name was Bobo Chucky Bobo, uh, which is stupid I guess in Spanish, and they didn't want that uh, in the title. So uh, as I was working on it, um, it, uh, it it stuck as the journey of Little Charlie. Uh, both ones are okay I think. And then another thing was about that I can remember now it's coming back to me. Uh, uh, Chucky Bobo, they said as soon as somebody hears Chucky, they're going to think of the little psychotic doll with the knife that is right. you know, acting away at people. So they, uh, we, we took that out of the title too. I've forgotten about that. There's so many things you forget about. A, uh, another question from Sydney asks, what's been the most difficult book to write or the most difficult book to work on? Um... The easiest by far was Elijah Buxton. I wrote it in about six months, uh, which takes place here in Canada. And it's a story of a boy who, uh, when, when we hear about the Underground Railroad, and then once the people get to Canada, it's like they disappeared. Uh, but that's not true. They There were settlements of uh, people who used to be enslaved and lived in Canada. Uh, that one, I just, I don't know, that one hit me at the right time. Uh, Mighty Miss Malone took a long time. Uh, my own fault because I wasn't sure if I would be able to write in the voice of a 10-year-old girl. Um, but as I, I thought about it, girls are different than boys, but not that different. And young people pretty much think, think along the same ways, which is why I can write about kids back in the 1800s or in the 1930s. And it's, it's still relevant because we haven't changed that much. So once I got over the thing of, can you write from the point of view of a girl, I, I depended on my editors and uh, people to tell me if, and my sisters, I have three sisters who are great readers. And, you know, they would tell me, yeah, you know, I don't like this part, I don't like that part. Uh, so that was kind of the hardest. But actually the hardest is the, the sanctuary sessions. I just, um, there's just been a lot of interruptions uh, the, uh, with the COVID kind of, uh, threw my rhythm off. I, I lost my writing place. For some reason, I can't write at home. I've told myself I can't write at home. And uh, I'm just waiting. Hopefully, they're getting ready to lift it again and I can get back on that one. Uh, a question from, an interesting question from Kaya. Uh, and if I, if I have it right, I think the question is referring to some authors say when they're writing, they've got an audience in mind that they're thinking about as they write. And some authors say, no, I'm writing for myself first. Uh, so Kaya asks, do you think about yourself or your readers when you're, or someone else when you're writing your, your stories? When I write, uh, I think about one person and that's Christopher Curtis. That's who I'm writing to and I'm writing for. 
Uh, when I write in a young person's voice, when I first write it down, it's in an adult voice because I, I just want to get the story. I want to get the direction of the story. And I, if I start to fiddle around with getting the voice age correct, that can slow me down. So I'll write it in uh, my own voice, the, the voice of an older guy, and then I'll go back and reshape it into the voice of a younger person. So, um, I, I, you know, and, and a lot of people do say you have to keep your audience in mind as you write. I, I don't. I write books that I think I would have liked to have read at that age and um, uh, books that I enjoy. So I, I think about, and you know, I've been doing it for so long now that I, I don't even have to think about it. I just, I just write it, but I know I'm writing to me because I'm not thinking about anybody else as I'm writing this. I'm, I'm writing for myself. Question from uh, Madam. Um, tough question. Of your books, do you have a favorite? Uh, oh, do I have a favorite? You know, if you ask most authors that, they'll say, oh, my books are like my children. I don't have favorites. Um, I have favorite books and I have favorite children. Uh, so uh, <laughs> my uh, daughter, I have my favorite 10-year-old. My daughter, Avion, is my favorite nine-year-old. And my son, Levon, is my favorite seven-year-old. Uh, but no, I, I don't look at... Uh, um, and my favorite book varies. It goes from the Watsons go to Birmingham to Bud Not Buddy to uh, Elijah Buxton to some of the time. It, it, it just varies, which I think is good, meaning that uh, it kind of depends on what I'm, uh, what frame of mind I'm in at the time. I don't uh, go back and read them unless uh, uh, it's to, like if there's a play or a movie that's going to be done by one of the books, and I have to look at the script. I have to go back and read the book to make sure I can remember what happened and uh, the spirit that I had. Uh, but I, I really, really dislike going back reading my books because uh, you read them so many times when you write them over and over and over again, you just get sick of them and you lose perspective. Uh, so I, I um, as I said, I don't read them uh, again, so this, I, I don't know what it is that caused me to like one at a time more than another. It's not like I read them again. Uh, I think I, I recently reread Bud Not Buddy. Uh, I haven't read The Watsons Go to Birmingham uh, since the movie was made of it. Uh, other books, I, I don't think I've read any of, any of my other books since they were written. I we have... Have we have time for probably just a couple more questions. So if you have questions, make sure to get them in the Q&A uh, and, and I'll make sure to ask them. Um, we have a question from Zainab who asks, you touched on this a little bit in, in, in your talk at the beginning, uh, but about whether you wrote stories as a kid, if you remember any stories that you worked on uh, or story ideas that, that you worked on as a, as, a, you know, as a kid or as a teenager. Uh, as a kid, I can remember I wrote one thing. It was about, this was at the time when uh, uh, spies were big. And I wrote this story about a, a spy and he uh, would go to this water fountain and he put his key in the water fountain and then it would open up a door and he'd go down. You know, you watch Get Smart, the entrance, uh, the uh, introduction of Get Smart, it was like that. Uh, it didn't go very far. And I, I never really thought of myself as wanting to be a writer, but I can remember I must have been 10 or 11 years old, which my older uh, daughter is, uh, she's 10, and she's showing signs of being a writer. And I can remember saying to my brothers and sisters at the time, I, I can remember saying to them, I'm gonna write a book one day and a lot of people are gonna read it. And they laughed, they laughed so hard. It's kind of scarred in my memory now that uh, they laughed at me like that. But I, I never had a real drive or desire to be a writer. Uh, I think the fact that I, I liked reading and could read was very good practice for becoming a writer. Jasmine asks, uh, now, do you feel proud of being a writer? Jasmine, I do. I really, really do. It's, uh, um, and, and this is something that has developed maybe in the last five or six years. Before I just 
uh, it, it was hard for me to think of myself as a writer. Because as I said, I started when I was, my first book came out when I was 42 years old. So that's a whole lot of time uh, between um, birth and the time that you became a writer, a professional writer. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I had, what, what was the question again? Uh, do you feel proud of being a writer? Do you yes, take pride I, yeah, in this I profession? Very proud of now, now that uh, um, I have some perspective on it, I, I am, and I take it very seriously. And I just judged a, a contest uh, for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. The Golden Kite is an award that is given by them to somebody. And so uh, I read almost 200 books. And um, it, it sounds like that might be too much, but uh, I, I was so proud to be a member of this community. There were so many wonderful, wonderful books that I read and so many uh, new authors that are coming up that uh, have such great potential that uh, judging the contest, reading the books, uh, really did make me feel proud that I am in that community. A flip side of that same question from another question from Kaya asks, uh, did you ever have doubts? about being a writer? Did you ever have doubts about selling your books or that they'd find an audience? Um, and I guess the, the, the follow-up question is, do you, do you have any doubts now? Do you ever have those doubts about being a writer? Uh, this is kind of like the question that someone asked Miles Davis. Miles Davis was a jazz trumpeter, probably the greatest jazz trumpeter in the world. He played billions of concerts, billions. He played concerts all the time. And someone asked him, uh, they said, Miles, you know, do you still get nervous before you go on stage? And Miles said, and Miles, this, Miles had a gravelly voice like this. And Miles said, if you ain't a little bit nervous, you ain't paying close enough attention. So that's the way I feel. If you, yeah, I have doubts. Uh, I don't know if the doubts ever go away. I don't know if it's a good thing if the doubts would go away. Uh, because uh, I'll write something and I'll read it and I'll say, wow, this is really good. And then I'll read it again 15 minutes later, and I, I'm embarrassed by it. But uh, I, I think one of the things of becoming a writer and becoming a professional writer is you learn, you just have to get over that. You have to trust yourself. You have to have faith in yourself as a writer, and uh, you have to let it go. Um, you know, they're talking about books being like your children. In some ways, I, I can understand that because when you send a book out, books are very personal. You know, I think if it's a well written book, there's something of you in that book. And when you send it out and a lot of people are going to read it, hopefully, or if nobody's going to read it, you know, you're, you're exposing yourself in a lot of ways. So, uh, um, yeah, that never ends. And especially when you're younger, you're going to be, uh, have doubts all the time. Doubts are good. Just work through them, keep going, get your work done, move on to something else. Try to sneak in one more question here before we end. Uh, a question from Elizabeth. She asks, if you weren't a writer, what would you be? Well, Elizabeth, when you start uh, becoming a writer at 42, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of mystery in what you'll be. <laughs> I would be. I'd be working as a garbage man or mowing loads or doing something like that. Um, uh, that that's just the way life turned out. Uh, uh, I found something that I I love to do, um, and I was very very fortunate. And that's one of the things where I tell people: be patient, because it, it, writing takes a long time. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of work. Uh, um, be patient. Be true to yourself. Just uh, uh, in, enjoy it. Enjoy it while you can. And uh, that's where I am right now. I'm enjoying it. Last question then. Uh, as part of our book up program, our students are reading. They've read but not buddy. They'll they'll look at a few other books each month. Uh, what are three book recommendations you'd have for for young people right now? Uh, that's really hard to do is to give three because there are like as I said, I just read two hundred some books. Um, I, I'm first. I'm going to give some anything buys by and some of my favorite authors uh, that. Uh, uh, I, I think you should look up anything by them. Uh, Jerry Craft, uh, 
His books are, are wonderful. Lori Alts Anderson, anything by her, Varian Johnson. My three books that I would recommend, I tell you that I, I couldn't narrow it down to less than four. Uh, one is by Pam Munoz Ryan, and it's called Manana Land. And it's just a very touching book. Uh, Varian Johnson's The Parker Inheritance. Um, uh, a book by a woman named Kimberly Brubaker Bradley called Fighting Words was a real surprise. I read it towards the end of the contest and I was, it was almost done and, you know, very well written, uh, but I didn't know if it had that little pizzazz, that little something extra that makes it special. And then it was like a sucker punch. She, she, Kimberly Brubaker Bradley sucker punched me right in the face. Excellent book, um, that, that one I recommend. And then another one that I, I was bowled over was Ways to Make Sunshine by Renee Watson. So, um, oh, Jacqueline Woodson's Before the uh, Ever After, too. Another great book. Before the Ever After, Manana Land, Parker Inheritance, Fighting Words, Ways to Make Sunshine. I guess that's five or six. The, the more the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for being with us here. Thank you for answering questions and, and for the insights and rules that you, that you led with. Uh, thank you to everyone watching. Uh, thank you to our students in the Book Up program and, and teachers and students who are tuning in with us today. I want to invite you all to our next Book Up ses session, which will be on March 17th. Uh, we'll be joined by the National Book Award winner for young people's literature this year, Kaysen Callender, who's the author of King and the Dragonflies. So join us, uh, join Kaysen Callender on March 17th at 4 p.m. for our next book up session. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you.